Okay, now we're going to talk about the Phillips curve. The Phillips curve is this really curious relationship that exists between unemployment and inflation. The Phillips curve was written, has been written about by a lot of different people, but it gets its name from a British economist, A.W.H. Phillips, who in the mid-1900s wrote a paper illustrating the inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation over a long period of time in the United Kingdom. Basically what uh, Phillips observed was that in times when the economy is slowing down and unemployment rates start to creep up, then wage rates don't have to climb very quickly because all these people out of work, they're not expecting higher wages. And if wage rates don't go up, then inflation stays low. So basically, what we have with the Phillips curve is that there's a relationship that says if unemployment is high, then inflation should be low, and vice versa. Because there's not this pressure put on wages and consequently put on prices if we have high unemployment. Now, if unemployment is low, then there are, there's this tight labor market, wages are rising quickly, and inflation goes up. That's what the Phillips curve basically represents. Now the question that really arises is not sort of what is a Phillips curve? What is a Phillips curve is pretty easy to understand. In fact, we can see if we draw a graph of the Phillips curve, what it's supposed to look like. If Phillips is indeed correct, we should be able to draw this graph, we'll put unemployment on the, on the horizontal axis, and we'll put inflation on the vertical axis, and we should see a curve that looks something like this, where this inverse relationship between the two variables uh, is, is manifest in the graph. Now, the reason this is important is because it signals that there could potentially be a trade-off that can be exploited between these two very important macroeconomic variables. And so politicians and policymakers could potentially seek to stimulate the economy, accept a little bit of inflation, and in so doing, reduce the amount of unemployment significantly. Now, this particular curve does, uh, as I say, show up, and Phillips got his papers published on this particular curve because there was this relationship. In the UK, it shows up okay. In the United States, it shows up pretty well. In fact, this is a perfect curve if we put some dots in here to illustrate some of the data that was available in the United States. This is basically the 1960s. We're in 68, 1967, 1966, 1965, and so on, down to about 1962. We see this almost perfect Phillips curve exist. Now, of course, policymakers see this. They realize the implications, and they say, wow, we could potentially really fine-tune the economy based on this inflation unemployment trade-off. And if we can get some specific data to tell us how much inflation leads to how much of a reduction in unemployment, then we've got some really important information, some really important policies that we can write, and we can almost with certainty figure out what this trade-off is. Now, you know this, this data is from the 60s, and that's a long time ago. Since the 60s, we've seen some rather, shall I say, unusual patterns in this inflation unemployment trade-off. It isn't nearly as consistent as Phillips says. In fact, in an attempt to sort of save the Phillips curve, two really important economists, Edmund Phelps and Milton Friedman, said the problem with this is that you're not paying attention to the correct unemployment numbers. Uh, Friedman in particular said you've got to pay attention to what's called the natural rate of unemployment, which is the unemployment rate that is typical in your economy. And it's not just these, these wild swings and these variations in your year-to-year -year unemployment numbers. You want to see what is inflation relative to the natural rate of unemployment. It's something called the expectations augmented Phillips curve. Now, okay, so, you know, what, what, what are we dealing with there? Well. The problem with Friedman's position is that nobody is really sure what the natural rate of unemployment is. And so if you don't know what your natural rate of unemployment is, how do you compare it to inflation? It, it was sort of a stretch for Friedman to, to try to save the, uh, the, uh, the Phillips curve. He and Phillips sort of philosophically don't agree, and most of, Phil, uh, of Friedman's writings wouldn't 
tend them, lead them to, uh, or lead him to, a, to support anything that would allow a policymaker to, to make this trade-off. So it's kind of an odd position for, for Friedman to take. Nevertheless, Friedman tries, tries uh, hard to save the Phillips curve. Now, as I mentioned, there have been some odd-looking Phillips curves since the 60s. Friedman's data allows us to sort of fix some of that oddity, but ever since the early 90s, we've seen no Phillips curve whatsoever. A pretty important economist in macro terms, uh, Brad DeLong, wrote a really interesting paper and asked the question, what happened to the Phillips curve? Where did it go and when is it coming back? Is it ever coming back? And his conclusion is very simple. Can we really expect something as complicated as the macro economy to be explained by this simple inverse relationship between these two vital macroeconomic data points? DeLong says, basically, I don't want to say it's coincidence, but it's coincidence. And just to illustrate that point, let's take a look at one of the more recent attempts at drawing a Phillips curve. This is the Phillips curve from the, basically from 2000 to 2008. And it's got a real neat shape to it. It's just not a Phillips curve kind of shape. And basically what we see is this. A Phillips curve with that nice shape. Where we start off here in 2000, we end up here in 2008, and in between we have almost this rectangle on its side of a Phillips curve, which just says the relationship between unemployment and inflation isn't as consistent as Phillips has said. So what does that mean for us in terms of policy? It means that if you believe in the Phillips curve, you believe that there is a trade-off between the two macroeconomic data, uh, data sets there. And you could easily construct policy that leads you to a very, very bad outcome because a lot of the data over the course of the last 40 years has shown that that nice, neat relationship doesn't really exist.